In the last study, we looked at why the books in the modern Bible are accepted by Christian scholars as canonical and textually accurate. Now let's see if there is historical and archaeological corroboration for their claims. Now as Christian journalist Lee Strobel, who used to be an atheist, points out in his book The Case for Christ, if we find archaeological and historical evidence that coincides with biblical references, that doesn't prove that the Bible is entirely credible. But just as criminal investigators explore the veracity of a suspect's claims against actual evidence in order to determine their credibility, whether the Bible's claims are backed up by facts does tell us a lot about whether it's a trustworthy source. If we were to find evidence that directly contradicted the Bible, this would cast doubt on all of its claims. If it contains errors about history or geography, for example, how do we know it tells us what Jesus really said? On the other hand, if the Bible is right about history and geography, well that makes it all the more reasonable to believe that it would be right in its portrayal of Jesus. Now this will be a brief and very incomplete treatment as there are far more pieces of evidence and ongoing explorations than we could ever hope to cover in this segment, but we'll try to hit the major points. For those points we don't get to cover, the following statement by famed Jewish archaeologist Dr. Nelson Gluick is worth noting. He said that, quote, It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. It's also rather remarkable that Dr. Gluick built his archaeological career not seeking to prove the Bible, but using it as a guide, a guide which turned out to be reliable as it led him to over 1,500 ancient sites in Israel. One final note about miracles. While we will be exploring possible natural explanations for phenomena the Bible says were acts of God, that doesn't make them any less miraculous. The timing, outcome, and sheer improbability of these events make it clear that God was directly involved. Although the New Testament's account of Jesus is arguably the most important part of the Bible to Christians, the Old Testament's many accounts of God's direct activity in the lives of humans makes it an excellent place to test the Bible's veracity. According to the Bible, all ancient civilizations should be able to trace their histories to two events, the Flood or Deluge and the Tower of Babel. Most critics dismiss these as impossible and clearly just mythological simplifications used by early civilizations to explain ancient history. However, a number of diverse civilizations apparently held beliefs about their origins that were surprisingly similar to the Bible's explanation. Dr. Samuel Noah Kramer, an expert on the history of the earliest known Near Eastern civilization located in Mesopotamia, has reported on numerous Babylonian historical texts. In Sumerian mythology, he writes, quote, that the biblical deluge story is not original with the Hebrew redactors of the Bible has been known now for more than half a century, from the time of the discovery and decipherment of the 11th tablet of the Semitic Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh. The first part of this poem deals with the creation of man and animals, and with the founding of the five antediluvian cities. For some reason, the passage involved is completely destroyed, the flood was decreed to wipe out man. But at least some of the gods seemed to regret this decision. It was probably the water god Enki, however, who contrived to save mankind. He informed Ziasudra, the Sumerian counterpart of the biblical Noah, a pious, God-fearing, and humble king, of the dreadful decision of the gods and advised him to save himself by building a very large boat. The long passage giving the details of the construction of this boat is destroyed. When our text begins again, it is in the midst of describing the flood. All the windstorms, exceedingly powerful, attacked as one. The deluge raged over the surface of the earth. After, for seven days and seven nights, the deluge had raged on the land, and the huge boat had been tossed about on the great waters, Utu came forth, who sheds light on heaven and earth. Ziasudra opened a window of the large boat, Ziasudra, the king, before Utu prostrated himself. The king kills an ox and slaughters a sheep. Thomas Bullfinch writes the following about a Greek legend in his Age of Fable. Quote, Jupiter addressed the assembly. He set forth the frightful condition of things on the earth and closed by announcing his intention to destroy the whole of its inhabitants and provide a new race, unlike the first, who would be more worthy of life and much better worshippers of the gods. So saying, he took a thunderbolt 
and was about to launch it at the world and destroy it by burning. But recollecting the danger that such a conflagration might set heaven itself on fire, he changed his plan and resolved to drown it. He goes on to explain that this flood was immense, quote, now all was sea, sea without shore, and that the only survivors were those on the highest hilltops and a few in boats. Christian apologist Josh McDowell writes in the new evidence that demands a verdict that similar flood accounts are found all over the world. The Greeks, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Mexicans, the Algonquins, and the Hawaiians. It is certainly interesting that such completely detached civilizations would share such a specific event in their mythologies, but which account is the right one? McDowell explains why the Bible most likely tells the original story. Quote, the other versions contain elaborations indicating corruption. Only in Genesis is the year of the flood given, and the length of the rainfall in the pagan accounts, seven days, is not enough time for the devastation that they describe. The Babylonian idea that all the floodwaters subsided in one day is equally absurd. Now as for the confusion of languages as described in Genesis 11, this too has many pagan equivalences. Christian bishop Eusebius quotes Greek historian Abidenus, giving a Greek version of the story as follows. Quote, but there are some who say that the men who first arose out of the earth, being puffed up by their strength and great stature, and proudly thinking that they were better than the gods, raised a huge tower, where Babylon now stands. And when they were already nearer to heaven, the winds came to the help of the gods, and overthrew their structure upon them the ruins of which were called Babylon. And being up to that time of one tongue, they received from the gods a confused language, and afterwards war arose between Kronos and Titan. Secular Jewish historian Flavius Josephus includes the following quotation by the Sibyl in his Antiquities of the Jews. Quote, when all men were of one language, some of them built a high tower, as if they would thereby ascend up to heaven. But the gods sent storms of wind and overthrew the tower, and gave everyone his peculiar language. And for this reason it was that the city was called Babylon. Aztec descendant and Mexican historian Fernando de Alba, a name I can't pronounce, wrote in his Obras Historicas the following, quote, And as men were thereafter multiplying, they constructed a very high and strong zacuali, which means a very high tower, in order to protect themselves when again the second world should be destroyed. This is most likely a reference to the flood mentioned in other indigenous South American mythologies. At the crucial moment, their languages were changed, and as they did not understand one another, they went into different parts of the world. In addition to these and other ancient references to the events of Genesis 11, it seems that philologists, those who study the origins of languages, now find it reasonable to conclude that all world languages had a common origin. Wheaton College professor of archaeology Joseph Free reports in Archaeology and Bible History that Italian professor Alfredo Trombetti says he can trace and prove the common origin of all languages. German philologist Max Müller also attests to the common origin. And Danish linguist and Copenhagen English professor Otto Jesperson goes so far as to say that language was directly given to the first men by God. One event that most people wonder about is the Exodus and the plagues and parting of the Red Sea that went with it. After reading a number of detailed articles in the Biblical Archaeology Journal, as well as various other online articles, it becomes clear that scholars disagree about when it actually happened, by a difference of generally 200 years. If the earlier of these dates is correct, it could come to within about a hundred years of the 16th century eruption of the volcano Santorini, which could explain the polluted water, the hail and ash, as well as the invasion of creatures and the dead livestock. Now as perfect as this explanation sounds on the surface, the prevailing belief among scholars today is that the exodus took place during the 13th century, based partly upon archaeological evidence found in Egypt. Thus, the volcano explanation is widely considered to be false. A perhaps more likely explanation is given by University of Cambridge physicist Colin Humphreys in his fascinating book, The Miracles of Exodus. Humphreys takes a look at the biblical account from a much more scientific than archaeological perspective, which gives him a fresh approach to this long debated subject. 
His explanation of the plagues of Egypt is quite interesting, and the most believable that I have found. The following is a summary, with each explanation starting with the plague that it describes. Water turned into blood. Red soil particles plus an epidemic of harmful red algal blooms during the flood season of the Nile caused estuaries near the delta where the Israelites are believed to have lived to turn red and fish to die from the toxic algae. Frogs. This polluted water would have forced the huge frog population of the river ashore where there would be mass death due to starvation and dehydration. Flies and gnats. Insects living in the area, including the biting midge and the stable fly, would breed rapidly due to the population collapse of the frogs. Disease and death of livestock. Blue tongue virus and African horse sickness are naturally carried by the biting midge. Together, these diseases are known to be fatal to the very animals the Bible says die, without harming humans or other Egyptian creatures such as cats and pigs. Thanks to the exploding population of midges, these diseases would have likely caused mass animal death in the area. Boils The stable fly is known to bite people and animals, and thanks to the unchecked population of these insects, infection of the bites would likely have been widespread. Hail. At this point, an exceptionally severe hailstorm hits. Now certainly this would be a rare event, but not unheard of. Locusts. Desert locusts, attracted by the damp sand from the hailstorm, would settle and lay eggs in the area. Darkness The hot and violent Egyptian winds, known as the Compson, produce dark and dense dust storms, the likes of which are known to bring a heavy darkness that can literally be felt. The death of the firstborn As this violent sandstorm rolled in, grain, made damp by the hailstorm and contaminated by tons of locust feces, would have been rapidly stored by the Egyptians before more was wiped out. This, along with being stored in unventilated storerooms sealed by the sandstorm, would allow mycotoxins to poison the grain, a poisoning that leads to rapid internal bleeding and death. In Egyptian culture, firstborn sons were to be the family's heir. Thus, it's not unlikely that they would have been fed first, and thus more likely to eat the poisoned grain. Firstborn animals, a distinction obviously made for a reason, otherwise they couldn't be so easily identified in the Bible, were then fed to make them better sacrifices to appease the gods. By the time these firstborns were fed, most of the remaining grain would have probably been older, and thus not as contaminated. Now why didn't the Israelites experience all these plagues? Well, Goshen, the slave colony of the Israelites, was certainly not built right next to the Egyptian city, and thus it may have been far enough away to be isolated from many of the plagues. Humphreys readily admits that these are mere speculations, but he gives sufficient scientific detail in his book to establish his theory as quite plausible. Certainly it's all a huge coincidence, but that's what makes it miraculous, not to mention the fact that Moses apparently predicted each plague before it occurred. As for where and how the Israelites crossed the sea as they escaped the Egyptians, this too is the subject of much debate. Many scholars hold that Red Sea is a mistranslation of the Hebrew Yam Suf, which means Sea of Reeds, and that the Israelites thus crossed a marsh. However, this is a conclusion rejected by many scholars based on other biblical uses of the phrase, which are more obviously in reference to the Red Sea. Explanations ranging from tsunamis to tides have been suggested for how the Red Sea could have receded and then closed, but these ignore the biblical description of eastern winds holding the waters back and then drying the seabed. 
Humphreys has an explanation for this too, and like archaeologist Ron Wyatt who found a chariot wheel here, he believes the Gulf of Aqaba to be the most likely location of the crossing. His reason is based upon a natural phenomenon called wind setdown, in which wind can force water back hundreds of yards along a sloping shoreline. For this to succeed in holding water back so far, it needs to blow for hours, which happens to coincide with the biblical account, which says that, quote, All that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. He also believes, based on his knowledge of physics, that had this wind come to an abrupt stop, a wall of water would have rushed back over the land with a force sufficient to knock over a horse and its rider. Unfortunately, political forces in the region have prevented a thorough archaeological exploration of the Gulf of Aqaba, meaning there may be further evidence waiting to be uncovered, but for now we can only theorize and wait. Another Old Testament story that sounds unbelievable is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by raining sulfur. However, as Bryant Wood of Associates for Biblical Research explains on ChristianAnswers.net, not only have these cities been located southeast of the Dead Sea, they were obviously destroyed by an intense fire that started on the roofs of all the buildings. Additionally, bitumen, an asphalt-like mixture often containing sulfur, is plentiful in the area. And before the ruins had been found, geologist Frederick Clapp theorized that an earthquake could have spewed this material into the air, like it's described in the Bible. After this, it was found that a fault line actually does exist beneath the sites and that there is evidence of an earthquake having occurred. In his new evidence that demands a verdict, Josh McDowell explains many biblically relevant findings that resulted from the discovery of thousands of tablets in the excavations of Ebla, an ancient city located in what is now northern Syria. Only a fraction of these tablets have been translated so far, but there is already a significant list of interesting references, including the following. Place names mentioned in the Bible, Hebrew names such as Israel, Ishmael, etc., tributes on the scale of those the Bible claims Solomon received, early records of religious practices that critics have claimed did not appear until much later than the Bible claims, and finally, early mention of Hebrew words that critics have claimed did not appear until much later than they were supposedly written in the Bible. We could go on as there are many other examples of historical corroboration for Old Testament stories, but to keep this study concise we will stop here. Hopefully these examples have made it clear to you that there is plenty of reason to believe that the writers of the Old Testament weren't just making stuff up.